I have 8.30, so we can start. Uh, today was scheduled to be a guest lecture from Ali, but he got busy today and he rescheduled for next week on Wednesday. So I'm going to spend some time just showing you my research, more specifically my research on hypermetric computing, which is a lightweight machine learning algorithm. I'm just uh, reusing some slides here from uh, the, my preliminary exam at UCSD. Okay, so we all know that deep learning is all over in all kinds of applications nowadays, right? How uh, autonomous cars, eh, a little bit, right? Uh, we have uh, AI being used in robotics. Gaming is a huge area and being used in healthcare, financial ind industry is also using it, and we have machine translation, which is fairly mature. This great. Right. So there is a kind of large overarching challenge with machine learning, and that's the scale and power challenge. So example is Google's AlphaGo. And if you're not aware, AlphaGo is just, uh, it's one of the gaming applications of uh, deep learning, and it just plays the game Go. Go is very popular in Korea, and it's kind of popular in China too. And in 2018, I think, AlphaGo beat Isado. And he beat AlphaGo the next year, like 20, 2019. But, but it did beat him. You know, he's considered the top Go player in the world at the time. But the challenge is AlphaGo is running on around 2,000 CPUs, 300 GPUs. It takes a team of 100 plus scientists to maintain and create it. So this equates to one megawatt of power. So a Go game maybe is 15 minutes. This, if you are playing, if you're running this in California, $3,000 to play one Go game. Right? So this is very expensive, not very practical. But if we compare AlphaGo to Isado, Isado, his brain is running at 20 watts or 100 watts for his whole body. And in order to wake him up in the morning, he just needs maybe a hamburger, small meal and a copy, right? So we have lots to learn from how our brain functions. And we can use that to try and make machine learning or deep learning more energy efficient. So that is what we're going to draw inspiration from. So the human brain learns much better than machine learning models. For example, we just talked about it's very low power, right? 20 watts usually, uh, whereas traditional machine learning is very high power. It's also fault tolerant. You can have lots of noisy inputs. Uh, your neurons may die as you age, but you still remember things for the most part until a certain point. And, but for machine learning models, yeah, it's requires very low signal to noise ratio. It needs to have exact inputs. It's not very full. The other thing about our brains is they are highly parallel. We have hundreds of billions of neurons and trillions of synaptic connections. Whereas on computes, 
we're kind of limited to 4,000 to 100 cores, depending on the processor type. And the other thing is the human brain is very able to learn very fast and also unsupervised. Like if you show a toddler an apple, just one apple, and then tell the toddler that is an apple, and then you bring out a second apple, show them the apple, they'll know that is an apple. But if you try and show machine learning one apple, and you show it a second apple, it's not going to know what that app. It's not. It doesn't register. You need to show the machine learning model tens of thousands of apples in order for it to figure out that, oh, that's an apple. And then the other thing is, if you then introduce a banana to the toddler and you say, oh, this is a banana, and they learn what a banana is, and then you bring the apple back, you say, oh, what's this again? They'll say, it's an apple, right? But if you introduce a banana to a machine learning model, and you, you try and train it on the banana, and then you reintroduce the apple afterwards, the machine learning model will say, what's this? I don't know what this is anymore. You have to completely retrain it. So because of these factors, we want to take inspiration from the brain and design machine learning models based off of principles from the human brain. So this is the basis of hyperdimensional computing. So it's the sparse hierarchical processing in the brain. And what you get is a very dense, low dimensional input signal from our sensors. So in this case, like the retina from our eye. And that gets mapped into a very, a much higher dimensional sparse signal or pattern in our brain. And the pattern is being the neurons firing and which ones are not firing. And for the most part, more are not firing than firing based on the inputs that we are seeing. And this is the sparse distributed memory model. So it's a mathematical human memory model. And the way that we're going to use this in HD computing is we're going to create these things called hypervectors that are vectors that have dimensionality in the 10,000s. And here's an example. So we have this color black, and we want to encode it as a hypervector. We have this 10,000 dimensional binary hypervector that is just a pattern of negative ones and ones. So negative ones would be not firing, ones would be firing neurons. And this pattern, is, we're going to say, is representing black. So we just generate this random pattern and say, this means black. And we could do the same for white. So this pattern means white. And the key between these vectors is that they are pseudo-orthogonal. So if you take the similarity between them, we're going to say that if around half of the match, because we are generating these randomly, they are 0% similar. Right. So here is the hyperdimensional computing model used for classification. So we're going to have the training data for each of our classes. And we're going to map them from their low dimensional feature space. So whether that's like pixels in an image, uh, audio recording of voice, whatever the application is, it's in this relatively low dimensional space. And we need to encode it into HD space or into hypervectors. And then once we have all of the samples belonging to one class encoded into hypervector space, we bundle them all together, and I'll explain what bundling is, to create one class represent one class hypervector representing that class. So we get one pattern to represent class one. And then we do the same thing for all of our other classes. 
and we then have this model that we can use for inference. So when we want to do inference, this is our inference data. That's new data that we've never seen before. We encode it with the same encoding used for training to get this query hypervector. And again, this query hypervector is just a pattern in 10,000 dimensional space representing that low dimensional inference data. And now I have a 10,000 dimensional query vector and then n class hypervectors. All I'm going to do is now do a similarity check between the query and all of the class hypervectors. Whichever one is most similar, we're going to say that is the output. So which pattern is most similar to the pattern of the query? And this is essentially what your brain does. Like when you recognize an apple, it's just that the signal generated by your brain looking at the apple is the most similar signal to what you've memorized or remember as an apple. As we mentioned, so information is represented as a pattern of vectors in HD space. Right? We have black, we have white, and they are pseudo orthogonal. And the reason that we have very, very high dimensionality is that the larger in dimensionality that we go, the closer we get to having these vectors be orthogonal. So I mentioned bundling. So bundling is just element-wise addition in HD space. So you can think of this as memorizing. So to bundle, we're just going to, an example here is H is going to be A plus B plus C. So the new hypervector H is just going to memorize A, B, and C. And then if we do the similarity check that we talked about before between H and A, because A is in H, we get a very high similarity score compared to half of them matching. Maybe we'll get 80% 80, 80 matching rather than 50%, because we're considering 50% as zero. But if we do H and D, and D is not in H, we'll get about half of the matching, which is approximately zero. Okay. So this is how we can do this quick check of, is this hypervector stored in this hypervector or not? And this similarity metric can be many different things. It could be simply dot product. It could be cosine similarity, which would then normalize the results between zero and one. And it could also be Hamming distance. So Hamming distance just calculates the number of mismatches. So if we encode all of these images into hypervector space, and then we element-wise add them all up into H, then we can do this search between H and the banana hypervector. And we should see that the similarity score is very high. So we know that the banana is in H. This is exactly what the inference is doing. Or we're saying, is this pattern that represents this one sample in the class represented in any of these class hypervectors that are more general patterns because they encompass a whole bunch of different samples that we've memorized? And then there's also associating operations. So this is binding. So it's to associate two pieces of information together. So in this case, we're doing H is going to be A associated with B. And what's different from the association operation is if we have, so H and A are going to be still orthogonal, even though we're associating. A and D and putting that into H. And H and D is also 
orthogonal. So it's orthogonal to the individual components. It's also reversible. So if we have A, we can multiply it to H and get D back because we just cancel out A. We can do the same with D to get A back. And that's because of this identity analog, right? A is just a pattern of ones and negative ones. So if we multiply that same pattern to itself, one times one is one, negative one times negative one is one, right? So it just cancels out. So then we can do something like this, where we create a pattern that is going to be the category of animal, another one that is fruit, and we bind all of the animal pictures with the animal hypervector and bind all of the fruit pictures with the fruit hypervector. And then we can bundle everything up into one single hypervector. And then if we multiply that single hypervector by the fruit hypervector, we get the representation of a pattern of fruits. And if we do the similarity check with the fruit hypervectors themselves, we should get a very high similarity score. And then if we try and do the same thing, with the animal hypervectors, we'll get a very low similarity score. Because again, it's orthogonal to the original. Okay. All right, so in terms of applications of HD computing, we first just need to encode all of the data into HD space. And then we can apply that to the HD learning algorithm, which is just bundling. Right, it's just memorizing. Now we can do classification. We can do image classification, object recognition, uh, activity recognition, speech recognition, all kinds of different applications. Now we can also do other kinds of uh, machine learning applications like clustering, regression, reinforcement learning, and recommendation systems. And here is another comparison between HD and a deep neural network on some data sets. So we can see from the graph, right, HD is kind of comparable. It's a little less than these deep neural networks. But as we mentioned, deep neural networks are very power hungry, take up a lot of space, are usually not run locally, they're run on servers. But HD can run simply on your device. And this is a uh, retraining. So we can see from this graph, HD is very highly accurate, even just with one pass over the training sets, whereas the deep neural network kind of starts very poorly. And the other thing is HD is able to converge much more quickly than the deep neural network. So it takes a lot less training time. So I'm going to skip these extensions. Uh, I just want to talk about encoding. So how do we encode a low dimensional feature vector? That's this thing right here. So it's one through n dimensions into a 10,000 dimensional hyper vector. So we're going to do this by First, generating these two banks of hypervectors. This bank is called the ID hypervector. We generate one of these for each feature position. So in this case, we have n features. We have n ID hypervectors. If you have a 10 by 10 grayscale image, you have 100 pixels, right? So you would have 100 ID hypervectors. This makes sense? And then you have the second bank of level hypervectors. These are for encoding the values in here. So the number of level hypervectors is arbitrary. Here it's just denoted by Q. So you can determine, you can decide how you want to divide this up. But if we go back to grayscale images example, if you have eight bits per pixel, you have 256 different values, right? 
So if we wanted perfect precision, we would have 256 different level hypervectors. One representing zero, one representing one, all the way up to 255. But you can also just have, say, like 100 level hypervectors, and then you have each one representing a range. Like maybe the first one is representing zero to three, the second one is four to six, basically. So does this make sense? So the other thing about these level hypervectors is that unlike the ID hypervectors, they are not all randomly generated because we don't want them all to be orthogonal to each other. The ID hypervectors, we want them all to be orthogonal to each other because they're just encoding the position data. And each position does not necessarily have a relation with the other one. But with the levels, I want the <clears throat> 250, the level hypervector representing 255 to be relatively similar to the level hypervector representing 254, right? Because they're close together. So you just randomly generate the first one, and then you mutate it to create the next one. And then from that one, you mutate it to create the next one. And you do this mutation such that when you get from the first one to the last one, those two are completely orthogonal. So we see what these ID hypervectors are, what the level hypervectors are. All right, so now we need to use them to encode. So we get the first ID hypervector, right? Corresponding to the first position. Then we look up the value at that position, find the level hypervector that is representing that value. And then we bind them together because this is now associating that first position has this value. And if we have 10,000 dimensional ID hypervector, 10,000 dimensional level hypervector, element wise multiply, my resulting size of this hypervector is. Does it change? I'm just element wise multiplying. So the first one times the first one gives me my new first one, right? So it doesn't change, right? It's still 10,000 dimensions. And then I do this same process for all of the other ones. So I get the second ID hypervector, look up the value in the second position, bind those together, and then I bundle this result with this result. So this is, again, 10,000 dimensional vector, 10,000 dimensional vector. I'm element-wise adding. So I just add the first dimension with the first dimension to get my new first dimension. So again, this is a 10,000 dimensional vector. And I do that for all of the features until I get to the end. And I'm left with my final encoded hypervector, which is now the pattern representing this sample in 10,000 dimensions. So I'm not really asking you to remember any of this. It's just the main point is these operations are relatively simple, right? Element-wise add, element-wise multiply. It's not this huge matrix multiplication that is used in deep neural networks. So I'm going to, again, skip all of this and go to just retraining. So training, as I mentioned before, is just like the initial training. It's just bundling. So you take all of the samples after you've encoded them and element-wise add them all together. And now you have this general pattern that represents that class. But we can retrain the class hypervectors to get slightly better accuracy. So this is how we do retraining. We take the training data sets that we have encoded, and we're going to loop through all of the samples as queries. <clears throat> 
do the similarity check with our class hyper vectors that we created during initial training. And if we have a correct match with the query and the class that it belongs to, then we don't do any modeling. Because our model is correct, we don't want to change, right? But if we have an incorrect class match, like here, we're saying that the query belongs to class two, but it actually belongs to class four. So in this case, we need to update our model because we're wrong, right? And we want to be right next time. So to update our patterns, we're going to subtract the query from the class that we incorrectly classified to make it less similar to the query. And we're going to add the query to the class that it should have been matched to to make it more similar to the query. And by looping through the data sets multiple times, we'll increase our accuracy as we keep going. And we'll get to a point where we saturate, which is what was on that other graph. It took less than 10 iterations. So this is, again, just an extension, but I'm not going to cover that. And is there anything else I want to show you? I don't think so. Yeah. So that's just like the basics of HD. Sort of interesting. So the main thing that I really want to tell you guys, though, about this is just reiterating on how simple the operations are. Right? So going back to these slides, right? It's just binding and bundling. Element-wise add, element-wise multiply. And then the similarity check is can be as simple as just count the number of mismatches. So the barrier to entry on doing research in HD computing, fairly low. Okay. And the algorithm itself is also fairly simple. Okay. Just take all of the samples, encode them all, and bundle them all together to create your initial model. And if I'm wrong, when I'm retraining, I need to update it by doing that simple add and subtract. So if research is something you are interested in and machine learning is something you're interested in research in, you can do research on high computing fairly early on. Like just as an example, I can use myself as an example. I started research on HD computing in 2017. So I was a second year undergrad. It's relatively low barrier to entry, and I am not always looking for more students to work on this. Bit. Okay, if you're interested in something like grad school, it's good to kind of get that early start. All right, so this is HD computing. I am going to close this presentation. And since we do have 20 minutes, I want to pull up your homework too. Yes. What the hardware aspect? Hardware aspect is a little more complicated. I could show you if you come to join like the research lab. All right. So just while I'm going to pull up the homework too, the code for today is 682. Just answer anything to the poll. 
Okay. Um, just make sure I be sure. I guess before I tell you guys about homework two, how is homework one coming? Are you guys getting responses? No troubles contacting yes. people? Yeah, I'm going to hear you. Yeah, they just let us go respond to the same time today. Okay. Yeah, if you, yes. I just have a copy of response. So just to ping them back. And if you are just having trouble getting a response, we'll just wait for them to respond. So don't worry about the deadline of Dragon. If that's the case. But I will just ask you to ping them again. Okay. Does that mean just resend the message? Yeah, just replies to the same email. Just saying, just pinging this again in case you missed it, something like that. Oh, All right, so this is homework two. This is not dependent on a uh, response, so it should be uh, a little bit easier in that factor. So we have about 20 minutes left. So the plan was that you would have the entirety of Friday to do this, but we have now 20 minutes plus Friday to do this. And just to be clear, the three main categories of jobs that we're referring to here are the three categories that we talked about on Monday, right? So we have software, hardware, systems, right? And I would like you to focus on entry level, just so that you get experience looking for jobs that you might actually look for when you finish. <laughs> 